Hi, everybody. I'm Juju Chang with ABC News Nightline. And I don't know about Wonder Bras, but two incredible rock stars, maybe the Spanx of the uh, movement, wow. um, have, are on stage with me. Donna Hubbard is to my right, and she is absolutely uh, not just a survivor, but a passionate advocate uh, against trafficking. And you know, Donna, we talk backstage about how everyone thinks of human trafficking as something that happens in exotic places far, far away, but you are a testament to the fact that it happens very much here at home. You were a valedictorian, a college graduate, a DC beauty queen, a young mother, and somehow got sold to a gang. Yes. Tell us about that. You know, you do desperate people do desperate things um, and place themselves in vulnerable positions. People think that human trafficking is just being kidnapped from one country and brought to another, um, that it is just a violent kidnapping, but in my case, it was leveraging coercion. And I was a young mother who wanted to fit in. I was looking for love in all the wrong places, and I fell in love with a man that I just thought was he was the world, you know. He just loved me, and he treats me so good, and he buys me things, and I was his arm candy. And he took me to a party, and we were in a penthouse drinking champagne, y'all. And I thought that was just the greatest thing in the world, you know. I was a young mother. I had three children at the time. And I woke up with a man on top of me that wasn't him. And there were men standing along the wall waiting their turn. Mm. I don't know how long before I passed out, but when I woke up, I was left alone there. And I didn't know the men who had victimized me and abused me that night, but they knew who I was. And I would go out, I, I got, got up, I was so ashamed and so afraid and so in shock that I got up and got dressed and I went home and I never said anything to anyone. I was just traumatized. I never heard from him again. And I, I didn't understand what had happened. What did I do? And I would go out to nightclubs and go to parties and those men would lean over and whisper things in my ear about what they did to me that night. And I didn't know who they were, but they knew who I was. And I was raped again by another one of them in the hallway of a, of a disco in uh, and I just, I was so afraid I ran. And I took my children, I went to the West Coast. I lived on the East Coast at the time. And I ran, left my job, left everything, and ran, went to the West Coast. And in the West Coast, I found a little apartment for me and my children. And there was a man next door, he and his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's sister lived there. And uh, I just thought they were nice people, they were there to help us. He was a pimp. And after realizing that I was in the clutches of something that was not healthy or holy, I was so afraid for my children and for myself that I didn't know what to do. I didn't know that to tell the police it meant take me away from my children. I didn't know what to do, but it didn't matter because after a month or so, he sold me to a gang. A gang came and told me I belonged to them and I, did what, I would do what they told me to do or else one of my daughters would. And I would have done anything to protect my children. children. And I knew that the less they knew, the safer they were. It's the kind of story that I'm gonna let you take a deep breath. There's a lot to, to unpack, um, but Milan Verveer has spent her life um, fighting against this kind of scourge. This is obviously the kind of sad story you've heard for a long time, time and time again. But the first time that inspired you, you were working for Hillary Clinton. I was indeed, Juju. And Donna's story, unfortunately, uh, is just part of a much bigger global scourge, as you rightly called it, Juju. Uh, because this is a multi-billion dollar criminal industry today, probably ranking second only to drugs and drug dealers are finding it's actually more lucrative to get into the, the business of human trafficking because you exhaust drugs, you don't exhaust women. Uh, and it is the most nefarious, horrific experience anybody can endure, as Donna's story clearly illustrates. And I remember years ago, more than 20 years ago, I was working for 
uh, Hillary Clinton when she was first lady, and we encountered a group of women uh, in Europe. Uh, they were Ukrainian women uh, who came up to her and they said, Mrs. Clinton, you have to do something. And uh, they began to describe a situation that was extremely prevalent in their country, which was that women were disappearing. Their neighbors were disappearing, relatives were disappearing, others they had heard about were disappearing, and they couldn't get the government at the local level, at the national level, they couldn't get any response. And the phenomena was all about vulnerable people because these criminals really prey on vulnerable people who are desperate economically. Uh, women tend to be much more uh, marginalized and, and viewed uh, as second class in many ways. Milan, I want to just jump in because now part of what's happening is that the internet has become the biggest pimp, that a lot of these yes. runaways, a lot of these young girls are trafficked on well, the internet. And that's exactly true. What was starting in this modern day slavery, and it is slavery, yes. uh, that called for laws, and we in the United States passed by 2000 a very strong law, was responsive to this. And today you see it's that much more sophisticated Don't, because the praying is happening on the internet. Absolutely. And it's happening with great speed and great accessibility to women. Donna, you talked about how it's not just about, you know, being handcuffed to a radiator. Exactly. You, there's, there's coercion. There are, are drugs that you were using to numb yourself. And really that you broke the cycle by being and staying incarcerated. I knew that they were never going to leave me alone. I had traveled even out of the state and moved my children and I, and they found me. And um, I knew that they were never gonna leave me alone, so I ended up going to prison. It was the only way for me to get free. And to piggyback on what Milan said, this is a $150 billion business. And people associate gangs with weapons and drugs. But do you ever wonder where they got the money to purchase weapons and drugs? And so human trafficking is so much more than just sexual exploitation. We heard the story this week uh, um, in one of our cases where a young girl was kidnapped from her village, uh, from her town, and her head was shaved and she was used as a boy to transport weapons. Um, and when the weapons were stolen from her, they sliced her face. And so we said, well, why didn't, why didn't they uh, just use a boy? Because she was a girl, then... Uh, if they found that out, maybe they would just rape her and give her the weapons anyway. Milan, we're talking about globally, this is not just about sexual exploitation. This is about indentured servitude. This is modern day slavery. It is exploitation on so many different levels. Uh, and one of the largest levels is what happens in supply chains uh, when goods are manufactured. How much slavery is in that supply chain that we become enablers of in many ways by right. purchasing these products? Uh, it's what you heard in the Yazidi uh, opening uh, discussion. It's refugees who are preyed on. It's a, a consequence in horrific ways in conflict. The traffickers go in. It's agriculture workers and it's domestic workers. One of the largest unseen group being trafficked in our world today are domestic workers. Women go in search of income they get behind that front door in whatever place, and you never hear from them again in many instances. And Donna, you worked at the time as a flight attendant. You still do. I do. And there is a vital role that you played and, and you've trained others to play in spotting trafficking. You know, Juju, it's so important for people to understand that you've got to recognize it and report it. And so often you'll see a situation and you're like, uh, something's not right here, right. but I'm not sure what that is or who to tell. And so... Um, tell us about the young boy from Honduras that you spotted. Very good. And I was um, working number two on my aircraft, which is in the back, in the galley. And there was a couple that got on. They, we were coming from the Honduras. And there was a couple that got on with a young boy. He had to be about five years old, a little bit. He was too old to be carried the way they were carrying him like a baby. But he, they sat in the last row, very in, inconspicuously, but it didn't look right to me. And this little boy, the fact that they carried him was one thing, but he seemed to be in so much pain. He was sweating profusely. And if my child were that ill, I would not get on an airplane. I'd be trying to find a doctor somewhere. Right. 
And they got on the and airplane. And he looked maybe drugged or something? And he looked like he was lethargic. Mm -hmm. You know, he was in pain, he was lethargic. And so I knew something wasn't wrong, right, but we got him, you know, we have to engage them in conversation. And as soon as they, we took off, they laid him across their laps. And so we began to talk to them. At one point, the mother had to take, or who we thought was the mother, had to take the boy to the bathroom. And when we separated them, I told the other flight attendant, I said, why don't you talk to the father and I'll talk to the mother. We asked them the child's name. We got two different names. We asked, um, so I said, well, how old is he? She said he's five. The father said he's eight. So we knew something was wrong. And so we notified the, the flight deck and they notified ground personnel. Well, of course, we had to go through uh, customs and immigration. And when we went through customs and immigration, I said to the officer, we just reported this couple and, uh, you know, I wish I knew what was going on. This little boy is really, really sick. And he said, we've got somebody that they've pulled aside. I can't talk about it, but I think they're calling the hospital or the doctor about it. And I said, okay, I, you know, I just wish I knew what, what happened. The next day, I was coming back through Customs and Immigration, and I had the same officer. And I said to him, you know, remember me from yesterday? What about the, the little boy and the couple? He said, I can't discuss it with you, but I will tell you this. You made the right call. Wow. You made and, the right call. And, <laughs> and this is part of... What I love is it's part of the network of airline ambassadors, yes. flight attendants and flight personnel who are trained to spot this kind of thing. Milan, you were saying it's important to, when you see something, say something, because people need to intervene. Well, and I, I respect Donna so much, given what she went through, to be able now, uh, in many ways, to ensure that others don't go through the same thing. Training of airline attendants, training of hospitality personnel, hotels, where are those points where this kind of activity is going on? And one of the more innovative types of prosecution, I just got back from Seattle to do a story with Val Ritchie, the prosecutor, who's prosecuting super users of the internet. And Johns, busting Johns basically, but Johns who are using sexual slavery so often that they become sort of pimps online. Why is that an important tool well, in fighting it? One of the things that happened in Washington is, is happening in other places, uh, which is this recognition that at certain parts of the day, uh, men are using the internet uh, to uh, decide how they're going to purchase uh, their, their sexual adventures on any given day. And they began to track this uh, in King County, Washington, uh, and then came together to do something about it. The first thing they did is create this coalition of government and business called BEST, uh, businesses engaged in ending uh, slavery and trafficking, uh, and blocked in these companies certain features of the internet, certain uh, areas in which there was utilization at, at, at great uh, frequency. Uh, and then they in, engaged in a process uh, to ensure that employees were not doing this. So they, they began to make it well known that if you did this, we are not going to tolerate it. Uh, and it's measures like that, that whether it's stopping the criminals from getting impunity, because these are crimes that have to be punished and they're often not prosecuted, and, or whether it's this kind of thing that the prosecutor that, did in King County. That was what I was, you know, this is the important thing that I want everybody to understand is, People often don't report it, Juju, because number one, they don't want to get involved, and number two, they don't want to be wrong. And so it's important to understand that you can report it and you can, you can recognize it and report it and don't have to, be, to worry about getting involved or being wrong. Leave the, leave the wrong or right up to the prosecutors, the people that, the, in authority, and recognizing it and reporting it is what saves lives. There's a lot of um, justification, though, often when people say it's a, you know, there are a lot of libertarians who say, well, prostitution should be legalized. This is a victimless crime. These are women who are consensually engaging in this behavior. You know, yesterday I took some notes and I thought about uh, something that was said yesterday about making sure that we have men on board in this fight and that we have their affirmation and support. And that's true. But what do you do in the case of human trafficking when the people that you're looking to support you are the people that are trafficking you. And so often when I speak in crowds, I can look into the faces of, of men that are sitting in the audience who look away from me because in some way that self-incrimination that uh, keeps them from doing anything at all. Um, but 
We, we, train, we train airline personnel just so they can recognize well, it and report it. Well, and, and in some countries now, they are increasingly trying to deal with this. The, the Nordic countries, for example, are, are penalizing the clients, punishing the clients, not those who find themselves in this situation. I was talking to a woman who works with uh, trafficked women who are being arrested in Queens and the Bronx, and they're often undocumented Chinese women, and they're afraid now of being deported in this current climate, so they are even more sort of motivated to go back to their pimps. And how, how big a problem is that when people look at this as a victimless crime? Well, it's hardly a victimless, right. victimless crime, but it is a crime that occurs largely in silence. And you've got these dysfunctional holes of the uh, perpetrator on the victim. Uh, you've got entrapment in ways that it's very hard to get out of the clench their clenches. And we were talking about the link to childhood sexual abuse because so yeah. much of when you were saying you looked in the mirror and yes. you had a, you know, you were blaming yourself. It, but, it, it, Donna, go. The physical chains you can break in an event, but the psychological chains are broken through a process. And, and think, it, it takes a lot longer. And think of that undocumented worker. She's in a double whammy situation. She knows that she's vulnerable for all the reasons we all understand today. Uh, and the criminals know she's vulnerable and easy prey. So they go after her. And then she's in this bind of wanting to escape, but fearing if she does escape, she's going to be punished in some other ways. Uh, so and that's the question. People say, why, don't, why doesn't she leave? Why doesn't, why doesn't she, she run, run away? away? It's not that simple. I could have run away, but would they have gotten to my children before I could? And when I realized that the only way I was ever going to get free was to go to prison, I, I went to jail. I got arrested. And about two weeks into being held, my, I called home and my mother said, your friends brought us a microwave for friends. Or your friends, you know, I said, friends, what are you talking about? The guys, you know, the guys that were, you know, hanging out at your house, they brought us a microwave for me and the kids while you're gone. And that was their way of letting me know that they knew where my mother was. They are incredibly creative uh, and psychologically manipulative. And many of the women with whom I've spoken here and, and around the world say that their greatest fear is the reprisal to their family. Uh, that if they get out and the perpetrators know they got out, obviously they've escaped, or then uh, bring charges, their greatest fear is what happens to their family. It's exactly what Donna is saying. Can I tell you, uh, Donna, I bumped into your youngest daughter who's here today in the audience, and I, she's just a, a bubble of energy. So you did great. Thank you very much. You know, I, I have to say this because my children would get upset. I have. Seven, I have seven children I gave birth to, one I adopted. So I have eight children, wow. 10 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren, and I look good. <laughs> but but tell, me, tell me how you get from looking at yourself in the mirror in that prison uh, to here, because you, you now work uh, you've started a, a foundation, Women of the Well, mm -hmm. and, and that helps other formerly incarcerated women. Tell us about that process. When, while I was incarcerated, I saw so many of us that were just entangled. We didn't know how, what we were going to do when we got out, where we were going to go, how, where were we going to work, um, how, where were we going to live, who's going to hire us, you know. And so I started looking at what, what kind of resources were available even for me when I got out. They gave me 24 years, two 12-year sentences, and I was really blessed to be able to get out on parole. Um, by the time I got out, and there was only one place for me to go in Atlanta, and I realized there were no resources, and that if a woman does not have a non-judgmental, supportive, nurturing environment when she's released from prison, her likelihood of successful reentry is very limited. Mm -hmm. And so... I look, uh, you know, I also received Christ in my life when I was incarcerated and I got saved and today I'm a pastor um, and I, I'm really, really grateful. But I also look, read the story about the woman at the well um, and her life. And it was the fact that she told other people about her life and what happened to her 
that she was able to regain her life. And so I started Woman at the Well Transition Center in Atlanta, Georgia in 1998, and we provide services to incarcerated, formerly incarcerated women and trafficking survivors. We're on the street two nights a week um, from 10 at night to four in the morning because they're not out from eight to five, they're out from <laughs> in the middle of the night and somebody has to be there. We've been really blessed to provide services to over 6,000 women. Um, and now our goal is to open a transitional center, a residential program for women and girls who are rescued and women and girls who are impacted by the criminal justice system uh, in Atlanta. There are 200,000 um, women and girls engaged in human trafficking, but there are only 3,000 beds available in the United States for us. So. Air Airline Ambassadors International gives me the opportunity to travel around and educate people. And Women at the Well Transition Center makes it a realistic um, uh, opportunity for people to be able to help in, right. in ways that are viable and they can see. Milan, I can't believe, yeah, agreed. Totally worthy of applause. Milan, I, I can't believe we only have three minutes left, but you feel very strongly that everyone here in the audience can do something. What well, can we all do? Well, absolutely. I, you know, you can't help but listen to Donna and, and say to yourself, we can't let this happen to more people. She is doing everything she can and then some to ensure that others don't meet the same fate. But there's so much each of us can do. There are countless NGOs today, many started uh, by young men or women who have heard stories like this and want to do something and give back in their communities. I think it's so easy to access these groups and to figure out how can I volunteer, how can I support them. Secondly, public policy. It took agitation uh, by advocates on the outside to say, do something, get a law. We have a law. It is involved in three pillars, prevent, further crimes like this from happening, protect survivors like Donna, and ensure that the criminals are prosecuted. The budget that's been presented uh, to the Hill uh, is one that zeroes uh, or, or dramatically uh, decreases the kinds of resources that will go into these kinds of programs. We can't let that happen. Thirdly, we shouldn't be enablers. We, there's something called the slavery footprint where each of us can take a survey of how much are we participating, are we complicit in slavery by virtue of our purchasing habits. Right. Secondly, in the same area of our purchasing, we should think of how can we help those women today who are on the road to rehabilitation, getting over their traumas, dealing with everything that's happened to them. Right outside of these doors, there is a boutique uh, that focuses on artisan crafts. Many of those crafts have been made by women who are victims of trafficking in other parts of the world. There are so many things in this area, and of course, if you see something, do something. If you're suspicious, think of Donna. <laughs> uh, think of those airline attendants. I, I know a passenger who, who saw this young man on the plane, uh, he was a boy, uh, and she said, something is wrong. And the more that she and an, she went to the back of the plane, talked to the attendant, and they began to figure out the situation, that plane was met by Homeland Security and local law enforcement. Right. And that, that is, child is saved. It's incredible. I mean, the, the, the panel's title is In Plain Sight, and I hope that what we're saying today helps open all of our eyes to what's happening around us. Donna, closing thoughts? If you see something, I know the signs in the airport say, if you see something, say something, but you can go online and get at, at Classroom um, uh, 24 seven and get our training for recognizing and reporting human trafficking. Um, and what's important is to recognize it and report it because that's what saves lives. And if you really wanna be able to help and give back, we've got a GoFundMe page and look at Woman at the Well Transition Center, this 16-bed facility will make a difference. Thank you both so much. <laughs>